Hello, and welcome to Perry's Victory and International Peace Memorial. I'm Ranger Rob, and today I'm dressed as a U.S. infantryman to bring you our first program of the virtual Perry Education Days. Are you a nutcracker? You might be wondering why such a title for this. You're talking about uniforms, military. Well, that is what people ask us. When they see this uniform, their first reactions are, are you British? Are you French? Are you the North? Meaning the Civil War. Are you Confederate? Are you a nutcracker? And it's just real weird style of coat. People look at this big black hat, white feathers, big coat with tail stripes that lacing across the buttonholes of the chest, red cuffs and collars. People think I'm a, I belong, I should be in a marching band. Well, marching bands from today, high school marching bands, look back to these uniforms for inspiration. But during the War of 1812, it served a number of important functions. Uniforms helped identify who was who on the battlefield. You have to imagine hundreds, thousands of muskets going off, artillery, cannons firing. All this puts out a lot of noise, a lot of smoke. So little glimpses could help identify who's who on the battlefield. I won't say it's 100% foolproof, but you look and you see a guy in a blue coat, good chances they're U.S. See a guy in a red coat, they're British. Now, some more of the details of the uniforms. You look at the hat, big white feathers sticking out the top, a plume, silver plate, white cord. Number of things here, white feathers designate, designates it as army for the U.S., Silver plate, white cords, infantry. Same with the white lacing on the coat. Signifies this is infantry. Another our, uh, branch of the U.S. Army is artillery. Their hat. Because they're part of the Army, white feathers. A brass gold-like plate, gold-yellow cords on their shako. Helps identify them as artillery. Now the artillerymen's coat looks a lot like the infantryman's coat. The only difference is rather than that white lacing on the buttonholes and on the cuffs and the collar, you got a yellow or a gold. Same thing with the buttons. They're not silver. All this designates it as artillery opposed to infantry. Then people look at it and you look at this red coat, British. It's obvious. It's British. It's red. But there are so many cues here for the British to tell different units. A lot more in-depth than the U.S. You got this slightly uh, white with blue line down the center trim of the lacing on the buttonholes, the cuffs, the collars. That make things confusing. Every single British regiment had a different pattern or different style lacing. They might have a different color rather than this blue down the middle of the white lacing. Also, this is red cuffs, red coat. This is the 41st regiment that served at Fort Malden on the north side of Lake Erie during the War of 1812. So they are a true red coated outfit. However, if you had a royal unit in the army, They'd have probably blue cuffs on their coat, blue collar. So a little different. And those are just some minor things. Each Sometimes each unit had their own buttons. And that, their hat, their Shaco, pretty much the same as the U.S. model. The plate's different, of course. They, they got a lion and a crown on it because they're British for their monarchy, for the king, King George III. Officially, the regency of his son is in charge. You got the hackle, white and red, with a little button that says 41 with a leather rosette. All this to designate that this is a British unit hat. So that, well, what about British artillery? Well, if you're trying to judge armies and what they are, you'd expect it to be a red. But honestly... If you saw British artillery, you're looking at a coat similar to this. 
It's the Royal Artillery. They have a full blue coat with red cuffs with gold lacing. The lacing pattern is a little different than the U.S. Some other minor things there. But overall, the Royal Artillery and the U.S. Artillery regimental coats are the same. Think there might be problems there? There were on occasions, especially the Battle of Lundy's Lane. This does happen. People mistake who's who on the battlefield. Another aspect of military uniforms of the day, if you had a fifer or drummer musicians, they would not have worn the same coat as your regular infantrymen or artillerymen. They would re wear reverse colors. So for the U.S., a musician would be wearing a red coat with blue cuffs. For the British, depending on their unit, their, their uniform is going to be a little different. If it's a royal unit, it's going to be a blue coat with red cuffs. In the case of the 41st, they're red on red. So their uniform, if you go to Fort George, you can see they wore a white with an orange and red fancy lace trim. Your musicians always look a little nicer than everyone else. So their uniforms are different. So that's the basic of the land forces. There is one more force that serves on land, but they're part of the Navy. Those are the U.S. Marine Guards. Yes, it's not the Marine Corps back during the War of 1812. It's the Marine Guard. They would have served on land. They would have served on board ship. A lot smaller than today's Marine Corps. What does their uniform look like? Basically, it looks like the U.S. Artillerymen's uniform. Lacing slightly different, but basically a blue coat, red cuffs, gold trim. Now, when it comes to their Shaco, gold or yellow cords, gold or yellow brass plate. Now, here's the difference. Red feathers. So, if you saw red feathers in this coat, good chance it could be a U.S. Marine. If you saw white feathers on a coat like this, good chance it's U.S. artillery. So again, those little keys, keys help identify who's who on the battlefield. Now, Navy. There is no uniform. Why? Because with land-based troops, you're trying to make yourself look bigger, taller, stronger. Make it look like you know what you're doing. It's sort of psychological warfare. You get 500 guys 100 yards away. Are they 5 foot 8 or are they 6 foot? Well, on board ship, you're all grouped together. You don't need those identification keys of who's who because you're on board a ship. You got a flag flying up above telling you who's who. So sailors did not need a uniform. And no... Navy during this time had a uniform for enlisted men. They wore what they came with. When their clothes wore out, they went to the ship store and bought new clothes. After a while, people start looking the same. Unofficial uniform. Now, maybe you've got some money, you got some pay, you like the guys you're serving with. Uh, a lot of traditionally navies are going out and getting a blue coat. It can be cold out on the ocean or out on the lake in the evening. So a wool coat helps keep you warm. Now the U.S. Navy. Some articles talk about of the day in newspapers during the War of 1812. These guys come in with red vest. It seems traditionally maybe the British had white vest. The U.S. had red vest. Why would they do? Well, maybe they just like serving with the men they want serve with. They go into town. They want to look the same. They want to be matching. May they go get matching hats. A round hat That's what this was called. The front and the back curled down as the sides curled up the more you wear it. Now, officers are a different story. Here's an officer's coat. This is actually the captain's coat for the U.S. Navy. And if you had a British officer's coat, guess what? It looked very similar. You got gold lacing, gold buttons, blue coat with tails. Any idea why the U.S. Navy's coat would look very similar to the Royal Navy? That's because the Royal Navy is the big kids. They're the ones everyone wants to be like. They have the most powerful Navy in the world. 
So U.S. officers are trying to intimidate, um, copy those British officers, Royal Naval officers. And some U.S. officers before and after the War of 1812, they have to buy their own uniforms. They have a tailor make them. Guess where these guys are going to get them? They actually go to London. So the guys making the uniforms for officers in the Royal Navy are now making uniforms for the U.S. Navy during the war. Before and after, not during the War of 1812. Minor differences in the pattern of the gold lacing, where it is. Also buttons. Traditionally, U.S. Naval officers had eagles on their button. Royal Navy, you would not see eagles on their buttons. Now the hat. Again, goes with the uniform. Big. Some of these could fold flat. Some are rigid like this one. But you got gold lacing, almost like little epaulets inside the hat as well. There's several different styles of them. Perry, during the Battle of Lake Erie, from reading the records, did not wear a hat or coat like this during at least most of the battle. Why? Because if you got everyone else running around in a uniform like this, this uniform stands out. And you have marksmen, whether it be Marines, be it infantry with muskets, are aiming for guys like this as a possible target. You take out officers, you have problems aboard their ship. So that Perry wears more of a coat like this. It's a plain, simple one. And all officers had an undress coat. Well, there's one more force in both militaries, and that's militia. What's militia? They're the citizen soldiers. Think the Minutemen of Lexington and Concord. Some militias had uniforms. Others didn't. Some are just sort of come as you are, sort of like the sailors. And many of them came with a hunting coat. You got a long canvas coat with a almost like a hood or a cape on the back end. If it's raining, you can flip it up over your head, give you a little protection. These could be blue, they could be tan, they could be green. They could be gray, any number of colors. There's no uniform to them. Hat-wise, it's they're wearing whatever civilian hat they had. Maybe a straw hat, maybe a felt hat of some kind. Any number of things. These are militias. Again, some states did have a uniform. Others, by the time the war's going on, they're wearing whatever these guys can. This particular one, black with red trim, has this hat that goes along with it. This is the uniform or the coat and hat the Kentucky Mounted Volunteers wore. Who are these guys? Well, these are guys that volunteered to serve longer than many normal militias. They volunteered to serve on horseback. These guys went out and got matching coats, matching hats, and they all had dark colored matching horses. They're trying to look like each other. They're trying to imagine hundreds of guys in the infantry look like this in every regiment. These guys are trying to copy the regulars, look more professional, look like they know what they're doing. Also, imagine being on a battlefield and seeing maybe there's a lot more of them than 100. But imagine 100 guys in a big coat hat on top of a big black horse coming charging at you. What are you going to do? Are you going to stand there? Are you going to run? Are you going to fire a couple shots and then take off? That is what the British had to face at the Battle of the Thames after the Battle of Lake Erie. That charge. That brings me another part of these uniforms. Besides being key identifiers on the battlefield, they are part of psychological warfare. So are handed at that, make yourself look bigger, taller, stronger, make it look like you know what you're doing. Also, if everyone is wearing the same thing, you feel like you're part of a team. Just think about any sports you might play in school. They give you a jersey. Even if it's just the same colored t-shirt and the same colored ball cap. Just something simple so you can tell who's who. You feel proud. These guys wearing this coat in 1813 stationed at Fort Meggs. No, they've marched through the Great Black Swamp. They've dealt with insects. They've dealt with two sieges at Fort Meggs or Fort Stevenson. They've maybe some of them have gone help parrying the Battle of Lake Erie, and now they're at the Battle of the Thames, helping guys in coats like this. They feel like they have each other's back. 
The uniform is very powerful. It's not, it, it had its reasons. Because of the weaponry, the way of fighting, this was, this becomes a weapon in itself. Like to thank you for listening to me today. I encourage you to head over to our website. Check out our other virtual Perry Education Day programs. We'll be having a musket demonstration, talk on the carronade, a tour of the monument, many others. Hopefully you'll go check those out and see those posted online the next couple days. Thank you for using your national parks.